Thank you, thank you, Myra. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Richard Morris uh, today. So for various reasons, actually, because uh, of course, Richard as a modeler, as a plant scientist has made a mark in, in the field, but also Richard is um, an editor, actually an advisor for the, for the, for the journal, uh, the representative of the Journalist Center for, for the journal. So for, for this role, we, uh, we value the fact that Richard has a broad view on, uh, on plant science and also is well aware of the quantitative uh, aspects. So it's uh, in both aspects are <laughs> really important for, for the journal. And also when you have a broad view like this, you also need to have some kind of uh, distance with the different subjects. And uh, so if you, if you know Richard, you will also know that he has a sharp sense of humor, which is also a sign of uh, a good distance with uh, different fields. So I, I guess just a few words. So uh, Richard has been working on uh, our plants are uh, reacting or responding to environmental uh, fluctuations. So probably I could list the day length, uh, temperature pathogens, uh, nutrients. And so this is actually very interesting because this is a difficult task because things, it's, there's a lot of uh, math and uh, in all this. And so using a computational approach, you can address these questions. And this also includes uh, mechanical modeling, which is closer to, <laughs> to, to my field. So I think this is, uh, this is really nice. And uh, uh, today, I think the, the, the question that uh, Richard, you, you can correct me, will be a little bit about time, I guess. And uh, our time can help us uh, revisit uh, gene networks. Maybe I can, I can phrase it like this. So thank you very much. And uh, the screen is yours. Great. Well, thank you very much, Olivier, for the kind introduction. And yeah, today's webinar is going to be about this paper that we published uh, recently in quantitative plant biology. Most of what my group does relates to quantifying things in plants. So I'm very excited about this new journal, delighted to be associated with it, and very happy to be able to contribute. I had the pleasure of working with a really great team who are listed here for this project, but I'd like to highlight in particular Alex Calderwood, who basically single-handedly drove all the computational developments and analyses, and also Joe Hepworth, whose knowledge of flowering we couldn't have done without. The story starts off here. I'm sure you all recognize this as Arabidopsis thaliana. It's been the focus of fundamental plant science for a number of, of decades now. And thanks to genomics and systems biology in particular, this little weed is now characterized and understood in tremendous gene genetic and mechanistic detail. This is of huge value in its own right in terms of basic science and understanding, but of course there's an obvious follow-up challenge. And that's how can we use all this knowledge gained from Arabidopsis to gain insights into other systems such as crops. So that's the basic premise and the simple question I'm going to talk about today. How can we go from left to right, from model to crop? And there are reasons why this might work. During their life cycle, plants go through distinct growth phases, such as vegetative growth, reproduction or senescence. And these stages are common to all flowering plants, models and crops. So it seems reasonable that similar genetic programs may be active. So we can think of each growth stage as being defined by its current gene expression state, as depicted here by three blocks of color that represent different expression levels of three different genes. So this gene expression state would be characteristic of an associated morphological state as shown at the bottom. The next growth state can be then viewed as a consequence of the current gene expression state and the environment. The current gene expression state, G1, and the environmental variables, E, then give rise to a G by E function, F, that defines the next state, G2. So we have gene expression states progressing through development, perturbed by or in response to environmental signals. And an effective way of summarizing this progression through is through gene regulatory networks. So gene networks that have been determined in Arabidopsis might be an effective way of transferring knowledge to crops. And that's what we're gonna try and do. The underlying assumption here for us to transfer gene networks between species is that the transcriptomic states are indeed similar. And we can check this by computing the difference or the similarity between transcriptomes of two species at different time points, we can see how similar they are and how justified that assumption is. 
So if we plot one species on the x-axis, the other on the y-axis, so here we have the crop on the x-axis and the model on the y-axis, we can then plot this similarity and see which time points correspond. So here, dark blue means similar, yellow means not similar. And if we have a plot like this, this is plotting the transcriptomes over real time, this would suggest that the model species is going through development roughly three times as fast as the crop. So that's where the, these um, dark regions correspond. So you have a, day 30 corresponds to about in the crop, about to about day 10 in the model. If we plot the difference between transcriptomes of two species at equivalent de developmental time points, we, this might result in a plot like this. Again, dark blue means similar, so small distance apart. Yellow means not similar, so far away in transcriptome space. And clearly there's some structure here. And which the diagonal points correspond to different growth stages, some of which are shown here. So that's the basic idea of how we can test the assumption of, of whether transferring networks might be, might be plausible or not. So let's try this with real data now. So as I've hinted at, we're going to use Arabidopsis thailand as the model species, and we're going to make our life simple and start with something that's not too far from Arabidopsis brassica rapa as the crop species. There are plenty of good reasons for studying brassica rapa. They're a key component of much loved British cuisine, providing us with mustards, and as depicted here, the turnips. But it's not just turnip and mustard. Brassica rapa includes several important crops. But more importantly for the current study is the close evolutionary relationship to Arabidopsis. Brassica rapa and Arabidopsis are brassicaceae, that's the mustard family, which is a huge family of plants of around 4,000 4, species, and includes several important crops. These two species have a common ancestor and diverged about 40 million years ago. Although I won't touch too much on polyploidy today, this whole genome triplication around 22 million years ago is worth noting, as it does in introduce a few headaches that, in that we end up with multiple copies of Arabidopsis genes, which unfortunately can have, have quite different dynamics in, in Brassica. But that aside for the moment, if we want an important crop that's closely related to Arabidopsis, this is about as close as it's going to get. So it should be easy. Their closely related species have highly similar genes. They even look somewhat similar. In fact, we almost just need to transfer or change color schemes and we're done. So we collected an extensive transcriptome data set for Brassicarapa for a line called ROA, um, R018. We've got 17 time points in two different tissue types, leaf and apex. And for every time point, we have three replicates. I'll get back to the other line later. Um, it's, a, it's a fast, a rapid cycling um, brassica in the commercial use, which I'll touch on briefly yet later. But let's just focus on ROA team for the moment. So we can plug all of this data into this type of matrix that I showed previously and compare to Arabidopsis. And this is what we get. So there's no obvious pattern there at all, no correlation. Where's that diagonal structure that we were expecting that would match up different growth stages? I should add that this is only for genes that vary over the time course and also for which we have homologs between Arabidopsis and Brassicarapa. So it's kind of a best case scenario. And yet we see nothing there at all, no correlation. So our first th thoughts here were, hmm, well, that's fascinating. Fascinating as it may be, this does present a problem. And that if we want to transfer gene networks between species, this only makes sense if the transcript dynamics are similar, and they're not. So we have a problem. This is just another way of visualizing the data just to make sure that we weren't jumping to conclusions here. This is using something called the T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. Basically, it's like principal component analysis, but uses a nonlinear transform. And this is a way of, of summarizing in, in, in fewer dimensions, higher dimensional data. So what you can see here is, is Arabidopsis in, in the red color and Brassica rapa in, in green. One thing that's very apparent as Arabidopsis and Brassica rapa develop, they move on quite different, separate, distinct paths through transcriptome space. There's not a single time point where these transcriptomes overlap. So that's bad news. And it puts a nail in the coffin for transferring networks from models to crops. It's not going to work. 
The gene expression states are not similar, the dynamics of corresponding genes are different, and how can we justify transferring networks if the transcriptomes are so different? So despite their evolutionary relationship and similar growth stages, Arabidopsis and Brassicarapa are clearly quite different beasts, as caricatured here by these different geometrical objects. They're different and can't be aligned. Or can they? Sometimes you just need the right perspective. So we need to think about this. Is there a way that we can analyze the data and pick out these similarities that we couldn't find in either of these two previous methods? And it turns out this is a common problem. Comparing different time series is, is a well-known um, problem in speech recognition or is shown here in motion analysis. And techniques exist for this called curve registration or dynamic time warping for handling such problems. And this is mathematically the same problem as we have. And there are similar but distinct um, time dynamics that happen on different time scales, and yet there are commonalities and similarities that we can pick up in this. Whereas some machine learning approaches are very difficult to understand, this one's actually fairly simple. If you take two curves, you take one, and basically it's just a jump to the left, and then a step to the right. And using least squares, you bring the curves in tight together and compute a base factor. And this last step is very important to reduce the risk of overfitting. And this seemed to work well on some selected genes. Here are a number of flowering genes from Arabidopsis and Brassicarapa after time warping. And they look similar after all. So if this works for five genes, what about the whole data set? So we said, let's do the time warp again, which we did. And this now reveals the expected diagonal structure. Few. So there are actually similarities between these two species if we take care to comp computationally compare these. And this would justify then transferring networks. So we can cluster genes based on these time warping functions or registration functions. And this gives rise to groups of functional modules. And within these groups, there are uh, there are common um, go terms. So what this is doing is, is identifying modules that have similar functions. And with these modules that are distinct between Arabidopsis and, and Rapa, we can then infer networks and compare them. But note that as shown here, the parameters for the registration functions are different for different sets of genes. So groups of genes are desynchronized compared to Arabidopsis. So you have these modules that are kind of um, operating on different time scales compared to Arabidopsis. And that's why they get lost if you do a, just a straightforward comparison of the transcriptome states. So from that, we infer what the initial data suggested that there's actually no common developmental time between Arabidopsis and Rapa, despite the similar growth stages, despite their evolutionary relationship, based on the transcriptome data, we can't say there's a common developmental time. But now we have these, these modules identified with this time warping method, and within those we can compare networks. And the causal structural identification approach allows us to do exactly this by inferring relationships based on the dynamics. So just briefly how this works. So um, this basically considers um, hypotheses for which genes might, might regulate what. So there are so-called parent genes shown here in the top row. So yellow, blue, green. And these might, these are all hypotheses for which for what regulates another gene shown at the bottom in gray. So let's assume the parent genes have the dynamics shown here in the top on the top plot, and the child dynamics, the genes shown at the bottom plot. We can then plot one against another and evaluate how well this can be described by a simple function. So the functions here show the posterior distribution for this inferred functional relationship between the child and the parent genes. So this is the full distribution. So as you can see, the yellow curve is very tightly defined, whereas the blue and the green curve have a very large spread. So in terms of what's a likely functional relationship, 
we can then use um, Bayesian inference to put values to that. And it turns out that the yellow, unsurprisingly, is a far more likely relationship for a regulation of the parent and, and child gene. So using this approach, we can then look at, at sets of genes. And we focused here on the flowering time network in a particular gene called SOC1. And the reason for focusing on SOC1 is that it's a well-known and transcription factor involved in the floral transition, but it stood out in terms of this time warping that we did in that it stretched by a factor of two between Arabidopsis and Brassica rapa. So therefore differences in the regulation of SOC1 are promising candidates to explain the delayed floral development between rapa and Arabidopsis. Network inference suggests Arabidopsic expression dynamics of SOC1 are consistent with regulation via repression of FLC and activation by fruitful, as has been previously reported. So that just confirms that this um, network inference um, can give um, consistent results with, with previous observations, and that's in the Arabidopsis data set. So we then did the same thing for the Brassica Rapa data set. And this is where this triplication causes headaches that I mentioned earlier. So now we just, we don't have one copy of each of these genes, but multiple copies. So we have to take care to look at how these individual genes um, are maybe regulated by other genes or regulate um, child genes. And there are several fruitful copies as, as shown here that are potential regulators for SOC1. But interestingly, none of the FLC copies of which there are four here show any evidence for regulating SOC1 expression. So this seems to be different between Arabidopsis and, and Brassica rapa. In Arabidopsis, FLC, apical FLC expression declines prior to SOT1 upregulation, but in R018, FLC declines only after SOT1 is upregulated. So this suggests a model that's different from Arabidopsis for rapid cycling rapa, in which the transition from vegetative to floral occurs prior to the decrease in expression of FLC in the apex. And consequently, SOC1 expression over development is delayed in RO18 relative to the other flowering time genes. So we now have a model for flowering in rapid cycling brassicas. Can we understand what makes fast brassicas so fast? RO18 is a well-studied yellow sarsen oil type. It's, rapid, it's a rapid cycling brassica rapa, but there's much faster out there. This commercial um, rapeseed mustard, Charisha 14, develops extremely rapidly, undergoing the floral transition 10 days after germination, about seven days earlier than RO18. So how is this achieved? A brief reminder of the basics of the floral transition, day length is measured in the leaves, which produces a protein called FT. FT then moves from the phloem to the apex, where it triggers the transition. So we have an encoder, we have a transmitter, and a decoder. And we can ask whether the differences in flowering occur in the encoder or the decoder, i.e. is Charisha 14 rapid because the encoder is more sensitive or because the decoder is more responsive. The transcriptomes in the leaf are highly similar and progress the same. This is again using this um, T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding to visualize high dimensional data. So there's no obvious difference there in the leaf, but there are differences in the apex. And simplified, we can see how these two cultivars diverge from a given um, time point onwards. So that's where development progresses differently in Charisha 14 compared to RO18. And based on what I told you about the, uh, the floral transition, a very obvious and nice hypothesis for this is that FT triggers the early transition in, fourth, in Charisha 14 compared to RO18. If that's the case, we'd expect that those genes activated by FT would be differentially expressed between the two cultivars in the corresponding time points. We don't see that. The differentially expressed genes in the apex between RO18 and Charisha 14 are shown here in bold and underlined, and they don't include FT-related genes. Indeed, registration indicates that FT expression in the leaf is only approximately two days ahead of Charisha 14 compared to RO18, and actually at a very low level. So actually FT expression is generally really low prior to the transition. So it looks like this idea of FT triggering this transition was wrong. However, looking into other hypotheses, the data seem to support a model whereby the ratio of, of microRNA 156 to 172 might activate flowering. These two microRNA are known to be important for the juvenile to adult transition and may prime the, the apex for early transitioning. <clears throat> 
So there's still plenty of, of analysis going on and we've only scratched the surface here, but this is about as far as we've got on that. So I think with that, I'll, I'll summarize um, what this, what this um, work has shown. So the work shows that a simple comparison between transcriptomes might lead to the inference that they're not similar at all, but actually using advanced techniques such as time walking or, or curve registration allows for common functional modules to be identified. Whilst we can identify these common modules, it's worth noting that there doesn't appear to be a common developmental time between Arabidopsis and Brassicarapa. It turns out that Arabidopsis and Brassicarapa share many functional modules, but these move differentially through transcriptome space. They're desynchronized relative to one another compared to Arabidopsis uh, and, and Brassicarapa, as indicated by, by the arrow shown here between different sets and different modules. And our data are consistent with rapid cycling Brassicarapa actually bypassing the vernalization of photopiary pathway, at least for the two cultivars that we looked at here. So as I said, we're still analyzing the data and this was just a first glimpse today of, of how far we've got. And in collaboration, we're studying and, and doing carry out similar studies also for Brassica oleracea, Brassica napus, and as well as Brassicarapa. So it'll be fun to see how these different modules compare between these three, three species. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all the generous funding we've re received for this. And I'd like to thank uh, my, my group for all their, uh, their excellent contributions and just point you again to this paper, which includes um, for the details on everything that, that we've done, includes the data, the software and the scripts and, and in the supporting material. So um, with that, I'll thank you for your attention and try and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Very clear, very didactic talk. I, I love the movie. <laughs> very uh, self-explanatory. Self really, really cool, cool work. Uh, so before questions arrive, maybe I, I can start with um, um, just a curiosity question in a way. Uh, so with your approach, uh, can you distinguish uh, go terms that are more or less sensitive to developmental time? So can, can you distinguish things that are completely independent from developmental time or others that are, I mean, between species, huh, of course. But. A great question. So that's turning things the other way around. We haven't done that, but yes, I think we could. So we've done it the other way around. We identified modules and then looked for go-term enrichment. We could do the other thing and say, and say which have the most sensitivity. So we could, we've clustered them. Yeah, we, we could do that. That'd be interesting to see. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah, okay. Because the, the, I guess the follow-up question would be, uh, uh, I mean, there's always this, uh, this idea that uh, genes are, are conserved, but they have uh, different functions that the plants are tinkering with uh, whatever genes are available. And so I, I, my, I guess the, the associated question would be uh, to, to, your, uh, to your mind, I guess, so what, what would be the, the level at which there is conservation? So is it at uh, transcription factor level? So probably not from what you're saying. Mm -hmm. but would it be at the hormonal level or uh, I, I don't know. It's an open question, I guess. Yes. Yeah, so um, so you, there are probably two answers to that without having looked at it in detail, but there's um, we initially do filter by which genes do or don't vary over time. So we could do, we could, that would be the first port of call for that. And that would probably give broad brush clusters that do or don't vary. But far more interesting is what you just touched on the last part of your question, because indeed some of these homologues, well, lots of these homologues don't have the same dynamic behavior, but the homologues will have the same go term descriptions. Mm. So there'll be differences there in terms of the dynamics and associated go term analysis. And it'll be interesting just to see how that, how that pans out. So if we clustered by, initially by variation over time, and then applied a filter based on the differences in the registration functions. And then in those sets as a, as a whole, did go to an analysis. It would be interesting to see which terms were enriched there. We, we haven't mm. done that. That's a good, it's a good idea there. Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, maybe I have an, another question maybe for, um, uh, let's say someone who is not doing genetics, but who um, likes the idea of uh, <laughs> this uh, registration idea. So let's say for instance, I'm a cell biologist. I just take that uh, just <laughs> completely by chance. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I look at the process, let's say cell division, for instance, between the uh, wild type and mutant or different species. And also I can see differences in time, but not in gene expression. It's more in terms of uh, behavior of uh, cytoskeleton or uh, 
uh, I don't know, like uh, activity mm -hmm. of a cyclone or something like this. Could you do the same? I mean, could you use the same approach for this type of um, elements, let's say? Uh, so not genes or not uh, transcription factors, but um, I don't know, uh, behavior in, in image or... Um... Yeah, any, anything that has, that has dynamical behavior. So time brain behavior, we could do something similar. Absolutely. So this has been, and that's kind of where we got the um, ideas from to start with. It was looking at how other people in different fields, I mentioned motion analysis, speech analysis, where you have similar patterns, but they're sort of shifted, delayed, stretched over time. Anything that's any any time series, you should, in principle, be able to apply to this. And yeah, perfect. <laughs> okay, I see a question uh, uh, from uh, Yushen Long from uh, Singapore. Follow up on uh, Olivier's comments. Would one consider to define new Go terms for minimalistic modules? <laughs> Hi, Yuchen. I good to good to not see you again. But good to, thanks for the question. Um, <laughs> minimalistic Go terms for. Like a, a new go terms for minimalistic uh, modules. So I, I guess um, your approach would allow to define. Oh, I see. Terms. Right. Yes. Um, yes. Not something we thought about, but but you're right. So if you if you, it's a good point. So this is a just to backtrack a little bit. This is a different way of clustering that I've, I've talked about now. So you typically cluster either by by functionality or by dynamic behavior per se, or expression level or something. This is clustering by differences in dynamic behavior. So that's, that's a, a different way of clustering. And interestingly, this did show a consistent enrichment in Go terms within those that are differentially different between uh, Brassica and, and Arabidopsis. And therefore, you, one could make the argument, which, have, which we've kind of made, that those are, are concerted modules and whether the scope for adding that somewhere in, in, in the functionality level, that would be interesting. It's a, it's a good idea, not something we've thought about previously, but indeed that would, come, would kind of be the next step in giving significance to these modules that seem to behave differently because it's the, it's the modules as such that are desynchronized. So we've done these time warping for every gene individually, and then you get different parameters for every gene, and then we've clustered all the genes based on these parameters, and that picks out these modules that seem to act in concert. And those mm -hmm. are the ones that are desynchronized. That's a good idea. Thanks. Cool. Uh, another question from uh, Murray Grant. So, more, inter more interestingly, can you associate within your comparative modules gene of unknown function that are co regulated, thus providing the opportunity for additional novel discovery and development flooring time? Great idea. Yeah, not something we've looked at, but yes, so in principle, absolutely, yes. You, you'd, um, we've, we've got vast data sets. We've just scratched the surface and focus on the genes that we think might be relevant or might be important or that we can map onto Arabidopsis homologs. We haven't taken that further in on the lines that you're suggesting, Murray, but that's a great idea. You, we could just blindly cluster by these registration functions and anything that's in there, annotated or not, you could, you would infer, would be co-regulated and may be part of a similar genetic program. That's, that's a great idea. Yeah. Actually, maybe I have a further question on this one, or maybe actually on the, the other question as well. Is uh, how far can you go in terms of uh, species? Because here you compare Arabidopsis and uh, Brassicarapa, but for instance, if I wanted to compare, um, I don't know, Arabidopsis and uh, Antirinum or uh, Arabidopsis and uh, Petunia, for instance. <laughs> uh, would, what kind of problems would you uh, encounter? <laughs> so technically it should all work and we've been in thinking about how far we can stretch it. So, um, the, so I mean, we do two things here that you need to do because we're comparing, if you're comparing, um, so if, if you had two diploids, you could just compare the dynamic behavior and wouldn't have to worry about homologs paralogs and so on and so forth. If we're comparing, as we are polyploid species to Arabidopsis, you need to have enough sequence similarity there to pick out the homologs and within that paralog. So that, that might become a problem the more distant you go if you're working in, in crop species. But you could step back from that and just cluster based on, on the dynamic behavior and then within that dynamic behavior do the same approach of well, how would we have to change those 
to match up to Arabidopsis. And, but if you, you'd need to know which genes are the, uh, the most similar. So without that information, you could just do it based on dynamic behavior. You end up with clusters of, of if you like, super modules of genes that you might not know what match to what, but all have the same dynamic behavior. So that kind of might be that you end up having to sort of somewhat lower the resolution of the analysis, depending how far you can push the, the homologue pairing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and actually, I, I was thinking, uh, so not within the distance between the different species, but mm -hmm. if, if you have um, a noisy dynamics, let's say, <laughs> so the dynamics is not so clear, right? So. Uh, I mean, this is a class of gene that is probably also interesting, not, not so much, I mean, in terms of developmental time and everything, it's probably uh, difficult to associate them with anything, but these are genes that are that can allow to be noisy, so they, I mean, actually, do you see this type of behavior in the, in the different types of uh, dynamics? So, yeah, so there are two, so first of all, this, I mean, the data that we've got, although it's a very, very nice data set, there's a lot of noise in there with transcript. Mm -hmm. um, variation. So that's all taken account for this with this base analysis and that we only actually register the genes for which we have sufficiently strong evidence that a highly a more highly parameterized model still has the most evidence for registration compared to them being. So you could just say are they similar, are they dissimilar, or how much would you have to strain, uh, shift and stretch. So we lose about two-thirds of the genes with doing that way because we're very stringent on which genes we actually accept for the registration um, or not. So, and that's where the noise does come in. So that already says that even with this nice time course data, we don't have enough evidence and that relates to the noise in the system of being able to make this, this inference. So that's the one bit of the question. The other bit is generally noisy data and we've the ones that don't vary significantly, i.e. with a pattern within the time course, we filtered out up front so and we haven't gone back and looked at those and you're right there, there might be something there that we, well there's a lot there that we're clearly missing um kind of. <laughs> but, but the idea was if if it if, it, if we can't even register the, the, the genes for which there is there are nice right. dynamics we're not <laughs> gonna have a, have a hope in hell for registering ones that are don't have that um Okay. Fair enough, yeah. <laughs> Just to make your life even more complicated, I was thinking that, uh, so yeah, it's uh, transcriptome data, but can, do you think in the future you could couple that with um, single cell transcriptomics or like uh, spatial transcriptomics, like to even have the, at the special level, like to also have the heterogeneity or the variability uh, specially, right, in space with <laughs> the registration in time? Is this something... To consider absolutely or... so 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 that's something we're very interested in yes and we've got some data sets on 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 that that we're starting to look at yeah so that would be very interesting hmm. okay really cool yeah i'd be curious to see <laughs> okay uh is there any more questions i don't see question in the queue so i guess people are satisfied <laughs> Well, thank you again, uh, Richard. A very, very enlightening uh, talk. So I think this is definitely going to be um, uh, a landmark in the field also uh, for um, outside of uh, basic research, because as you featured, it's uh, really addressing the question of the transferring to crops. And this is uh, a major aspect of it. So I think this is definitely uh, something to keep in mind and uh, to convey to everyone. So <laughs> to distribute everyone. So maybe I should end. Oh.